Say you're an esteemed scientist on one of the exciting California Academy of Sciences expeditions. You've just gotten a specialized scuba certification for deep diving, and you're on your way down into the ocean water. Light slowly starts to fade, your color perception just gets more and more blue as the fantastical colors of shallow reefs disappear to the depth you're adventuring to. This week on Wild and Wonderful World with Shayna Grace, we're venturing into the ocean's twilight zone. What is the ocean's twilight zone, and what's so cool about sea slugs? We'll explore these topics and ask marine biologist and nudibranch nerd Terry Gossliner in just a bit. I'm Shana Grace, and this is Wild and Wonderful World Podcast. Don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wild Wonderful World Podcast. I look forward to talking to you on social media. Now, let's really get into sea slugs and the real world Twilight Zone. You're probably wondering, what could be so cool about a common sea slug? I get that, it's just a slug, right? But don't be fooled, these little guys have some amazing surprises in store. Once on a very far away beach in Indonesia, deep in the Wakatobi National Marine Reserve, I encountered a little green alien of a sea slug. The day was hot, but the tide had come in, so the little pools of water off the beach had all began to connect. To my astonishment when I looked out towards the sunset, hundreds of thousands of these tiny little green sea slugs slowly oozed their way in squishy, slimy swarms. They were so young that their spiral shells, a remnant of evolutionary time and not much use to a modern day sea slug, remained inside their translucent green bodies. I didn't know it at the time, but I must have witnessed one of nature's weirdest synchronized events a mass reproduction of this tiny green specimen. Would they become fish food or make it out to deeper water where they could survive among the other Indonesian nudibranchs? I never did find out, but the memory of seeing them in such large numbers is one of my favorites to this day. Still not convinced that sea slugs are the absolute coolest? Here are some of the most interesting facts about these squishy little dudes. The truth is, sea slugs are some of the most bizarre, fascinating creatures to study as a marine biologist. They're part of a group of animals called mollusks. Mollusks include your octopus and squid, as well as clams, oysters, snails, and land slugs. Mollusks are generally defined by their unsegmented, soft bodies and the presence of an internal or external shell. Even squid have remnants internally of a shell and a plastic-like body part called the pen. Mollusks also have a weird, toothy tongue for scraping away food, called a radula. One kind of sea slug, called the sea hare, can be as big as an actual rabbit and weigh up to 30 pounds. They also expel purple ooze when threatened, like the inky smokescreen of an octopus or squid. Some sea slugs have the uncanny ability to utilize cells from other animals, a phenomenon called kleptoplasty. Imagine if you ate a salad and suddenly had the ability to use sunlight for energy like a lettuce or tomato plant. While this may seem like a crazy impossibility for a human, the Sacoglossin sea slug has this mysterious ability. It is the only creature in the entire animal kingdom capable of incorporating the cells from green algae into its own body and then using those cells to photosynthesize for food on its own. If that isn't cool enough, a group of nudibranchs called the aeolids can eat the tentacles of a jellyfish or other stinging animal and become able to use the stinging cells to defend themselves. Sea slugs come in all colors of the rainbow. Why are sea slugs so colorful? One theory is that more color means more poison, or more danger of harm if ingested, in the animal kingdom. A posomatic coloring of this kind is even found where colors no longer show up, like in the deep blue sea. How do you keep predators away with their colors when colors don't even show up? Use patterns in black and white instead. 
That's the case for undescribed species from the oceanic twilight zone. Scientists believe their harsh lines and patterns are another way to keep predators wary of poison and from taking a bite. Speaking of the twilight zone... What is it, and why do we call it that? This low-light strip of ocean between 100 and 300 feet deep spans the globe and is teeming with undiscovered life. Previously too deep for scuba diver sampling techniques, this all changed when rebreather dive technologies entered the scene. The Twilight Zone even has its own kind of coral reef. When you picture a coral reef, do you imagine shallow, sunny waters teeming with fish? While it's true that many coral reefs exist in this way, there are also reefs that exist in the low-light depths of the ocean. How can a reef exist without the sunlight for photosynthesis that coral and their symbiotic algae rely on? The answer to that question may involve the process of chemosynthesis, a process where bacteria and other tiny critters use hydrogen sulfide for food. Corals in the deep filter feed on the suspended microcosm of organisms without relying on algae and sunlight for food. It's curious and amazing stuff, only really researched by marine biologists over the last 50 years or so. With the twilight zone only becoming accessible for sampling in the recent past, it's not surprising that an entire field of study has arisen around it. Terry Gosliner is a leading scholar in sea slugs and has studied and described quite a few from this enigmatic zone. Recently, we sat down, online of course, to geek out about these fantastic creatures. How about just a, a quick introduction? Who, who are you? Okay, so I'm Terry Gosliner and I'm a curator of invertebrate zoology and geology at the California Academy of Sciences and I do a lot of research on nudibranchs or sea slugs and my work takes me to the Philippines and places like that all around the world where there's a particularly high diversity of species and that's one of the things that I'm most interested in studying diversity and then using that information to help us understand conservation. To kind of build off that, what makes you excited to study sea slugs and how did you first get into the field of of studying these organisms? Well, that's that's a fun question. So, um, you know, I'm excited to study them because I just think they're some, you know, I started off by just thinking they were beautiful animals, which of course they are, and some of the most beautiful creatures that live in the oceans. And and when I was a kid, in my early teens, I had read about nudibranchs, and I, but I'd never seen a live one. And my high school biology teacher took me out to the tide pools here in California, and I saw a live one, and I thought, wow, this is just so cool and I I need to find out more about these animals they're really fascinating and the more I learned about them the more questions I had and the more amazing they were and um, it was just something that I was really fascinated with from an early age and I knew I wanted to study them and and learn more about them that is so cool I feel like that's every every like budding marine biologist's dream, you know, like to have an organism or study um, methodology or, you know, just topic you're really curious about and then getting to work like in that field, that is so cool. Can you tell me quickly, what is the difference between a nudibranch and a sea slug? That's a question that a lot of people seem to have. Okay, well, so The first thing I would say in response to that is that, you know, sea slug is just a common name for a nudibranch, but even more than that, a nudibranch is one specific group of sea slugs, and so there are more kinds of things that are called sea slugs than just nudibranchs. So 
um, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect between the names and and what we actually mean scientifically. But I tend to use sea slug in a more general way about to describe nudibranchs and their close relatives that are also very slug-like, but not exactly nudibranchs. We've worked together on studying the evolutionary history of of nudibranchs and sea slugs. And so a question I have was, how long have nudibranchs over like evolutionary time been around compared to like other uh, common indicators of time, something like a, a shark or a dinosaur? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And we don't have an easy answer to that because unlike sharks and dinosaurs, nudibranchs don't make very good fossils and don't leave a fossil record because they're so squishy and they basically disappear when they're, once they die. And so, so we have to guess the age of nudibranchs by looking at some of their relatives have shells and we know that and then we can use differences in DNA to basically use what we call a molecular clock that looks at the genetic difference and how long it takes for different um, genetic differences to accumulate each mutation at a standard mutation rate. And so we can get an approximation of how old they are. And we think that, that nudibranchs in general are at least 140 million years ago, so they were crawling around um, when dinosaurs were roaming the earth, most probably. So they're a fairly ancient group of animals, as far as we know. But all of that is a lot of speculation, and that's one of the great mysteries that we may never be able to solve with more precision than what we think we know now. Gotcha. Wow, that is so interesting. I love looking at the evolutionary history of things, and um, it's it's weird what has existed like before what. Like I recently learned, and I I have to fact check this, but I recently learned like sharks were around before trees were around, for example. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just weird to put that into context sometimes. Yeah, um, it, I'm always surprised to learn that flowering plants were relatively recent things compared to a lot of the other groups that have been around for hundreds of millions of years. So understanding that timeline and the perspective is really important to understand how the diversification of life has come about. Why study the evolutionary history of nudibranchs? Well, I think um, one of the things that's really interesting about nudibranchs is they have developed a very different survival strategy. Rather than having a shell to protect them, the nudibranchs have, as you know, they have toxic chemicals that defend them and make them distasteful or downright poisonous to potential predators. And so understanding how that process has taken place tells us a lot about how different adaptations that can change the evolutionary trajectory from being a shelled animal to a shellless animal is really uh, very interesting. And, and one of the other questions that studying their evolutionary history can tell us is how many times different groups of slugs have lost their shell to become slugs. And we know from studying nudibranchs and their relatives that, that within that group, they've lost their shell at least seven different times independently. And so, um, so that tells us, it basically provides us the roadmap of change um, that we see in the natural world. And it's really important to know that the direction of change and how frequently, how frequently change has occurred to, to be able to understand how we have so much biodiversity on this planet. And so that 
that is um, really important into having a fundamental understanding of why we all got here, why we're diverse, and it's really important to build that understanding and to understand the process of evolution. Yeah, it's just so cool to see, you know, what learning about the past can tell us about our present day and sometimes even our future. There's really interesting morphology to nudibranchs and really interesting little morphological toolkits that we use to distinguish different species. We primarily worked with, with DNA because it's a newer technique that gives additional insight, but before DNA t techniques existed, there was the use of these morphological traits. So my next question is, what are some interesting morphological traits that help us distinguish different nudibranch species? Well, that's, that's a good question. And one of the really important things about nudibranchs is that they feed on a wide variety of different food. And they capture their food by having um, a structure called a radula, which is basically a bunch of teeth. And the structure of the radula can vary. And the individual teeth on, that make up this ribbon of teeth that looks sort that sort of function like a file does of scraping food from the the bottom like a file scrapes metal or wood and and um, removes part of that surface um, so the radula functions in that way and depending on the diet that they have the and what you find in different species is that they have different structures of the teeth and they may have sharp hooks on the the teeth or they may have rounded structures or all depending on the kind of diet and so um, you know it's almost like uh, the equivalent of having a Swiss army knife with different blades on it that you can feed on different things and and capture your food or collect things in a different way and so the feeding structures are really important and the other thing that's most important to nudibranchs is reproduction. And so we find that all of the nudibranchs have both sexes in the same individual. And so what you find in these hermaphrodites, as they're called, is that you have very specialized structures um, for mating and for transferring sperm from one individual to the other. and the details of those structures tend to vary between different distinct species. So those are some of the kinds of things that we look at. The other things are a lot more obvious and less subtle, but basic color patterns. And we know that, that species have very distinctive color patterns that vary a little bit, but they're usually much less variation between species. Uh, and closely related species have similar color patterns, but usually when we look at them carefully, they have consistent differences in their, their color patterns between closely related species. In the animal kingdom, color is so important. And one of the things that I touch on in this episode as well is like the theory of basically color and bright colors, meaning you know, don't take a bite of me, I'm probably poisonous or venomous, and nudibranchs are kind of no exception to that rule. And then also, um, so kind of to, to uh, segue into the, the twilight zone coral reef species of nudibranchs, what do you do when, you know, color doesn't really show up very well at those depths? And so, what do you do to show that you're still, you know, poisonous and please don't eat me? And one of the things that I talk about is, at least in the species that we had looked at in the Helgerta genus, they had these, these stripes or these very, like, black and white contrasted patterns that kind of function potentially similarly to the bright colors of, you yeah. know, the shallow water species. Uh, so that that is really interesting and I guess to segue into the Twilight Zone a little bit 
can you tell me about some of the research you've done in these deeper water species and how do we research animals in the twilight zone? Yeah, well, the, the twilight zone is so exciting because it's a, it's probably the least explored part of the ocean. And traditionally, you know, there wasn't much exploration of that, that depth range, which basically goes from about 300 feet to, to 500 feet in depth. Um, and basically, we knew very little about it because it was a very di difficult area to explore using submersibles and, and technology. And yet, our um, ability to dive to those depths was inhibited and we just didn't have the technology to do that. And now with the advances that we have um, using mixed gas diving and rebreathers, divers can go in, down to these extreme depths now and really explore this area. And it's been a really exciting and amazing new realm of discovery. And so that has really provided a, a wealth of new information. And just for example, with the nudibranchs that we find in the twilight zone and have found thus far, a few of them are species that are also found in shallow water and extend at least into the realm of the twilight zone. But the vast majority of species are unique to the twilight zone. And so it, about 90% of the nudibranchs that, that we've seen in the twilight zone are brand new species. And so they're not known from anywhere else. And when you did your work with me, um, that was of course the thing that was so exciting to us is that we had all these new species and studying their evolution, we found that the species that we were looking at were all each other's closest relatives, which suggested that the mode of diversification in, in the twilight zone for the, this one group of nudibranchs was that a single invader left shallow water and invaded the deeper water and then diversified in the twilight zone. And so that was really a great insight and probably the most exciting thing that we discovered together. And I was really thrilled when, when we got that result because we had no idea what pattern it was going to show. And then um, at about the same time, we had another intern working with another researcher at the academy and who was looking at damselfish. And what she found was that each one of the Twilight Zone damselfish had a different shallow water rep, uh, relative that it was most closely related to, which suggested a very different pattern of diversification, that basically the damselfish invaded the twilight zone and diversified many different times rather than a, a single evolutionary event. And so to me, that was just so great. And it was so fantastic that we just happened to have another student working at the same time with another researcher that we could find these different patterns. It is, it is really interesting to see these parallels and differences between different species in the twilight zone. And, you know, we're starting to see that the twilight zone might be much more diverse than we initially thought to where it, it might even rival the diversity of shallow water reefs. And I, I just think that is so exciting, um, the direction that research might take as we you know, continue to explore these regions. What is your favorite nudibranch species and why? Well, that, that's always a really challenging question to me because it changes almost daily. Um, I, because what I find so interesting is the, the diversity of different things that, that are out there. And, and I'm continually switching my research focus a little bit to look at something new and something different. And so 
I have new favorites. I'm very fickle that way. Um, I, <laughs> uh, whatever, you know, it's sort of like the nudibranch du jour. Um, the, what, whatever um, I'm looking at, I find the most fascinating in that particular moment. And then, but I will say this, the, the animals that you and I studied, the genus Halgerda, was, it, they're some of my absolute favorites because they have these in, not only you know beautiful colors, but they have these intricate geometrical patterns that each species has and, and these ridges and bumps and, and they're just such cool looking things. They, you know, they, they look like they were made up by somebody um, with a good imagination rather than the products of natural evolution. And, and it's really just so exciting for me to see, you know, you have this basic sort of framework and pattern of what they look like, and then you find something new that, that, that basically is a new innovation of that same theme and um so that's what i find the most exciting about nudibranchs and why i have changing favorites <laughs> oh man that is so wonderful yeah i the like i said earlier the diversity of of mollusks in general but as especially um like gastropod mollusks and nudibranchs is just incredible and I agree it's it's really cool to see a lot of the time you can see almost like the different steps towards like a final product nudibranch and it's just it's really cool <laughs> So that's it, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the first episode of the Wild and Wonderful World podcast. We've heard from expert Terry Gosliner today and learned loads of cool things about sea slugs and the Twilight Zone. Tune in next week for an exciting episode all about fish personality with special guest Rachel Gunn. That's all for now. Until next week, this is Shana Grace signing off. Mm -hmm.